What's up, everybody? We're going to talk about the best Bible note-taking system in the whole world today on my YouTube channel. My name is Matthew Everhart. I'm the pastor of Gospel Fellowship PCA. We're a Reformed Bible-believing church just north of Pittsburgh. Well, listen, I've done a lot of videos on Bible note-taking before. The problem is some of them are getting old. Some of them, the audio is kind of bad. Some of them have a bunch of different ideas spread out all over my various playlists. So today what we're going to do is we're going to put them all into one video called Taking Bible Notes, A Complete System, where I'm going to show you basically the distillation of everything that I've been learning and practicing, the skills and attributes that I've been accumulating over the years to hone in my own Bible note-taking system. I think I've got it all here in one place for you today. So anyway, glad you're here. Let's go ahead and dig in. Now, by the way, I, I think that uh, it's perfectly fine to write in your Bible. I'm not one of those people that thinks that the pages or the leather or the paper or the glue itself of the Bible is holy, but it's rather that it's the inspired and infallible and inerrant Word of God. So writing in your Bible is not a problem theologically. Please don't think that you're violating what it says at the end of Revelation, that you're adding to Scripture or subtracting from it or anything like that. You're just taking notes. You're learning. You're you're being discipled by what the Word of God teaches. But this is probably what your Bible might look like. Um, and there's nothing wrong with just taking notes. You've got some highlighting here. You've got some underlining. Maybe you threw some boxes around. Maybe you're trying to jam some notes and some corner places like this, and you're writing sideways, and you're, you're doing this and that. But, uh, you know, the really... If you think about it, you've got three problems with the way that you're doing notes right now. First of all, your colors don't mean anything. You just grab whatever pen that you're, you happen to have on your desk or in your hand, and you're just using that. So your color system, while it looks beautiful, it doesn't really mean anything. We're going to try to solve that problem here today in this video. The second problem is that you're jamming notes into every odd little space you're writing in the little return paragraph areas, you're writing sideways, you're writing upside down, anything you can to jam stuff in everywhere that you can. And then third, you just don't really have the room to write out any sort of full thoughts. You have some big ideas, and so you write down a word or two, but a lot of times what happens is you can't remember exactly what you're talking about later. You refer to Pastor So-and-So's sermon, but what was that? Well, I'm going to show you a way that we're going to solve all three of these problems at the same time. We're going to bring your color system into a theological order. We're going to give you a symbol system so that you can cue yourself to major doctrines without having to use a lot of space. And then we're going to solve the biggest problem of all, which is that you don't have room in your Bible to write out all of the thoughts that you have on a particular passage with the ability to reference them in some sort of a systematic way later. So we're going to solve all of those problems. Now let's jump in and solve, first of all, the problem of your color system. Um, grabbing any pen you want is totally fine, and I'm not a huge color person myself. So this is more going to be a do what I say and not what I do part of my little lecture here for you today. But um, you can come up with whatever color system you want to. I'm just saying that if you want to use the basic primary colors, it does seem best to me to assign a particular doctrine to each one of those particular colors. And I think probably the most logical way is to do it like this. Black would stand for God. God speaks in black and white, right? And so your main pen that you're probably going to have is going to be black anyway. So you might as well use black to write down your thoughts on God, his nature, his attributes, what he's like, things that refer to the Trinity, etc. And then green would be a fantastic color to do something with creation. Obviously, the world is a big, beautiful blue and green orb or sphere. So you might as well make green your color for creation. Brown would be perfect for sin because brown is just kind of an ugly color and sin is really ugly as well. And then red would obviously point to Christ and the atonement, anything that has to do with the blood or Jesus or the cross or his glory, things like that would be red. Orange could be the Holy Spirit for you. And probably that makes a lot of sense because the spirit is often imaged as like a fire and fire is orange. And so orange would be perfect for the Holy Spirit. Blue would be great for the church because of baptism. To be brought into the church is to be baptized. And so baptism, blue, water, you got that. Purple eschatology. Here we're thinking about the royal nature of Christ. He's going to return as king. He's already the king of all things, but he's going to return gloriously as the king. So purple being a royal color would fit that well. Yellow, the color of blessing. Just think of gold, gold and God's blessings upon you. And then whatever else you want to add. Uh, for me, I happen to be Presbyterian. So I think in terms of Reformed theology a lot. So a bright color like pink could be a special cue to look for things like the doctrines of grace or the tulip do doctrines, etc. 
So now you've taken your kind of uh, scattershot notes in your Bible, and now your Bible is going to look something a little bit more like this, where your colors actually mean something. So here, this green block is going to stand for creation. I've got the Spirit of God underlined in orange here, because orange is my color for the Holy Spirit. And then I've got the section of blessings down here underlined in yellow. And so as you see your Bible visually now, your brain is just going to connect doctrines with colors and things like that. And so your note taking is already going to look a whole lot better just doing that. If that's the only change you made, you'd probably already be improving your note taking system in your Bible. Now let's go to something else here that I think is really important. I use this all the time. If I'm not so much devoted to color coding in my Bible note taking, though I think it's a good idea, I am much more devoted to the idea of taking um, notes by way of symbols. Symbols can convey a lot of information in a very small place. Now, what I'm going to give you on the screen right here is an example of the symbols that I use. And what I would say is while you're free to borrow anything I do in this particular video, please don't think you need to immediately do exactly what I've done. I've had people email me before and say, please give me your exact, exact symbol list. That's fine if you want to use it, but it would be best if you came up with your own symbols so that, again, your brain would connect with what you're doing here. So what I've done is I've created a, a bunch of little symbols that I use all the time. And so I have a symbol for the Trinity because there's all kinds of passages where the Father, Son, and the Spirit are spoken of in the same context, especially in the book of Acts or in the Gospels. I've got uh, one for the resurrection here, the resurrection of Christ. I've got one for repentance. Notice it's going down and turning back to the right, which is what repentance is. You have to humble yourself and turn to what is right. Atonement is like an A with an arrow to it. We're being atoned to something. Money, Messiah, typology. That's an important one for me, especially in my interpretation of the Old Testament. Uh, a C for covenant, kind of in brackets, a J with an F sign, justification by faith, love, psalm singing, the tulip doctrines, total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints, if you're wondering, uh, reprobation, prayer, and then, of course, a little asterisk, meaning see the reference below. Now, I've got this little page of the Bible right here. Maybe you even have this exact Bible. This is a pretty standard ESV. This is like the thin line. Also, a lot of Bibles in the pews look exactly like this. So notice that these pages don't have a lot of room in the margins for note taking. So my symbol system is going to be able to do a lot where I don't have a lot of room to write. And so let me give you some examples of what that might look like. So here <clears throat> I've added a couple of symbols here. I've got an asterisk. I've got a T for typology. I've got a heart and I've got a C for covenant. So let's just kind of work through these. Now, my typology here is on verse 15, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. Well, that's a reference to Adam. But remember, Adam is typological of the greater uh, the greater head, the greater covenant head who is Christ to come. And so there's an interesting overlap between Adam and Christ discussed in Romans chapter five, for instance, where Christ does what Adam fails to do. And even as Adam is a covenant head, I guess I'm lecturing now, aren't I? A Christ is going to be the greater covenant head of his people. So that little typological symbol there just reminds me that there's deeper meaning here other than just mentioning Adam. Uh, notice here I've got this asterisk, and this is a basic symbol. Everybody should be using this probably. The asterisk, like in many books, takes you down to the bottom of the page. And here I just have a note to myself. By the way, all of these notes are just made up by way of example. Okay. See Burkhoff's Systematic Theology, pages 205 and 670. So that's just a little way to cue yourself to books that you're reading on the same topic. Very often you'll be reading a Bible passage and you'll say, man, I, I really have to remember that this corresponds with you know, this this or that book, what C.S. Lewis said or what John Calvin said or whatever, a simple asterisk system is going to solve that problem for you. And then, of course, I've got my other little symbols here for love and the covenants uh, in the Bible, by the way, holding fast is covenantal language here. And so all of these little symbols here, they just help me to put a lot of dense information into very small uh, usage of the margins and the pages of my Bible. I think that's probably going to be a very good habit to get into as you advance your Bible note-taking system. Now, uh, let's talk a little bit about making much more sophisticated types of notes in your Bible. And this is where I think this video is really going to be helpful to a lot of people. 
first of all, again, this is what your Bible note taking probably looks like right now. You're trying to smush in entire little paragraphs of thought into the random little corners and nooks and crannies of the pages of your Bible. The problem is most Bibles, unless they're a wide margin Bible or a journaling Bible or a note taking Bible, they don't have a lot of blank space. I mean, that's what Bible publishers do is they try to get a huge book into something that you can essentially carry around in your your hand or in your purse or in your backpack. So that's a lot of stress on the publisher. So they try to smush everything in. And usually that means you don't have a lot of spaces. So we try to do things like this right down the side and things like that. But the problem is this note here is already taking up a lot of, a lot of space, a lot of usable space. And so that's not really a great way to utilize the little bit of margin room I have. So what I want to do is I want to show you a better system that I've been using now for years. And it has really, really benefited me. And to be honest, this system is not something that I came up with out of the genius of my own brain. There's not a lot of genius in my brain, if any at all, but rather it comes from the man that I've been studying his life and his theology for many years, and that would be Jonathan Edwards, 1703 to 1758, one of the later Puritans. I guess actually he's an American, so he's not technically a Puritan, but we could talk about that in other videos. He's well known for his work in the Great Awakening, his thoughts on revivalism, his famous sin, uh, sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. But Edwards also had a remarkable system called his miscellany system, which I'm going to show you a variation of that in this particular video here. So um, look how much cleaner this note page would be if you could make some reference system to an external notebook, which is exactly what Jonathan Edwards constantly did. He's constantly making various external notebooks that he could bring his full note ideas into other places so that he didn't have to use up the marginalia of his Bible. So look at this. We're going to do something like this, and I'm going to show you how to do this. Hang with me here. Miscellany number one on creation, miscellany number two on the Trinity, miscellany number three on mosaic authorship. Well, what in the world does that mean? Well, the miscellany number right here is a number of that particular note that you're going to write more fully in an external notebook outside of the particular Bible that you're physically carrying around with you. And uh, the fact that these are numbered notes means that I can easily find out exactly what I was thinking about in that particular moment. And in fact, I can continue to add even more thoughts to it as I go. Let me show you how some system like that would work practically. Well, what you're going to need is to get yourself an external notebook. And this is going to be called your miscellaneous notebook. Now, I happen to have, whoops, as I smack my microphone. I happen to have mine right here. You've probably seen this in the background of my videos if you watch videos on this channel. It's a rather large notebook. It's about the same size as my Bible, so they're both kind of big books. I don't really want to carry this around, which is why it sits on my desk here in my office for most of the time. But the first thing you're going to have to do in your miscellaneous notebook is you're going to have to create for yourself a table of contents that you're going to continue to add to over the years, okay? So you're gonna to wanna to leave yourself several pages of space in the very front, the very front of this notebook for filling out your own table of contents. You're not necessarily gonna do it by page number, so don't worry about the page numbers on the book, but you are gonna do it by miscellany number, okay? And so your first miscellany here, miscellany M001. Now you can just do M1, but I do it M001 because my brain likes to think in terms of perfect lined categories, all right? so. Um, this is going to allow me to have up over a thousand or about a thousand miscellanies in one particular journal, assuming I have that much space in that in that journal. So miscellany M001, it's going to tell me that it cues to Genesis 1.1 and the topic is going to be creation. And so too also with miscellany number two on Genesis 1.2, the Trinity, miscellany three on Genesis, the book related to mosaic authorship of the Pentateuch, and so on you're going to go. You're going to leave several pages in the front of your miscellaneous notebook so that that table of contents can grow as you work through your uh, Bible note-taking habits over the years. Now, you're going to flip to the first page of your miscellaneous journal, and you're going to write at the top M001. And here again is your topic creation, Genesis 1.1. And here's your full note. You can write as much as you want. You could write a whole page. You could write two pages. You could write 10 pages. 
you are free to write as much as you want. You can write some little uh, shapes or you could write some symbols or you could do some sketches or some drawings. You can make all sorts of references to other books, to systematic theologies or other books you're reading. The point is that now that you've queued this to Genesis 1.1, Every time you're reading the book of Genesis and you see that miscellany note, you're going to remind yourself that you have this whole set of thoughts on this particular verse, okay? And so too, you're going to do it with these over and over again. Miscellany number two is going to be on the Trinity from Genesis 1-2. You see how the system works. And as you go, what you're going to notice is that your table of contents is growing, okay? Now, some of you are going to say, ah, but what if I get out of canonical order with my entries? No problem whatsoever. The point of the table of contents is to keep reference to everything that you're studying, but it does not have to be in chronological or can a canonical order. So notice, I just happened to make the first three in the book of Genesis just by way of example, but I could jump to Ephesians 1, I could go to Colossians 2, I could talk about Calvin's view of the Lord's Supper, or so on, Leviticus, or Romans, or 1 Timothy, or Leviticus again. That's what Jonathan Edwards did. He did not make this in canonical order, but rather the order in which he took those particular notes. And that's why your table of contents is going to be so key to you so that you can later find these things. But as you're, again, as you're reading through your Bible, you're going to have those notes placed in the margins. So you can always find where the note is in a relationship to its content, its topic, and its scripture verse. Now, you may say to yourself, well, what if I don't have my miscellaneous notebook with me? You said, Pastor Matt, that this is a pretty big book and you leave it here on your desk. Well, that's why I have a carry around miscellaneous book two. I call this book X. Now <laughs> you can call your books, whatever you want to. I don't know why I called this notebook X. I don't know why I started with M for miscellaneous and then jumped to notebook X, but I just thought X sounded cool. If you were more logical and sequential than me, you could start with notebook A or notebook B or notebook C, and then just go in alphabetical order. But I went with notebook X. And so I carry around in my little backpack all the time, notebook X. And so here I'm going to do exactly the same thing. I'm going to make my table of contents and I'm going to begin to write my miscellaneous entries into this. And the fact that it's X001 is going to remind me that it's in this particular notebook and not in this particular notebook. This is my M notebook and this is my X notebook and that's going to keep it clear. So I could have multiple notebooks. I could have a tiny little notebook. I could have a pocket size notebook. I could have one at home. I could have one at church. I could have one at work. The point is the letter is going to cue you to what notebook the note is in, and the number is going to tell you what the number and the order, and then the, the scripture reference where you can find it, and then whatever topic you happen to be talking about. So there's no problem with running out of space in any one of your notebooks. You just go on to the next notebook. It's no problem if you leave it at home. You could have a small notebook in your car, your bag, whatever. This is going to solve all of those problems for you. So here, let's imagine that we're looking back at the same page in your Bible again, but now you've been working on it for, let's say, a couple of years. Uh, you didn't just start it. Now this is what your notebook or your Bible looks like uh, years from now. So remember, the letter is going to tell you which notebook and your number is going to tell you which entry. So now I have M001 on creation, M002 on the Trinity. I've got X number 382. I've been doing a lot of note taking, haven't I, on lights? Here's M number 529. Boy, that notebook is really getting full. I've got M262 on the waters, X447 on heaven. You just imagine there's a lot of note-taking happening, but that's exactly what you want. You want to fill up your Bible with notes. There's so much you could be writing here in the same space that you could have wasted by just jamming in one kind of crammed just kind of haphazard style note right there in the margins if you're really trying to just smush everything in, which I don't think is the, probably the best way to do it. Um, now, some people will ask me this, well, what should I be taking notes on? I am not sure what I should even be writing down. Well, my answer to that is, well, practically everything. Uh, first of all, you could write down background information related to the text that you're studying. What kind of background information would there be about Genesis chapter one, or the book of Genesis in general. You could add personal illustration, something that helps you to illuminate the particular passage by connecting it to your own life. You could put prayers in your bar, in your Bible, in your wide margin, or in your miscellaneous notebooks. We'll say more about wide margins here in just a moment. 
You could put inspirational quotes and thoughts, again, things that you've read in Thomas Watson or Charles Spurgeon or something else that you're reading. The fulfillment of biblical prophecies would be an excellent way to take some notes. Subject and topic lists, you could smush in there somewhere. Uh, academic citations, again, referring to other books or theological works that you're reading. Textual footnotes and variants, alternate translations, theological and doctrinal notes, historical anecdotes, anecdotes, and especially, of course, links to your other notebooks. You may have many notebooks as this whole process uh, continues to build for you as you go. Now, some people are going to ask me about tools and resources, so I thought about this ahead of time. This is a question that I get all the time, and so I'm going to head it off at the pass. People ask me, what is the best pen for use in Bibles? My answer to that is very simple, and it's the same answer I've been giving for years. The best pens to use in your Bible are the Pigma Micron pens here described in this particular picture here. You can get this on Amazon. In fact, what I'm going to do is put a link in the description of this particular video. These are archival quality pens. They have very fine nibs, which is the tip of the pen, which allows you to write very small and very neat, and they do not smudge and they do not wear away. So this is going to be the one pen that you're going to use for all of your note taking. Now, you might use other pens for your actual miscellaneous notebook. For instance, you might like the gel pens or something like that. That's fine. But for writing in your Bible, you're going to want to use the Pigma Micron pens. Again, link in the description. People have asked me about what is the best highlighters. The answer to that is the Zebra Mild Liners. Now, there's a bunch of good highlighters out there, but you got to worry about some bleed through. And from all the testing that I've done over the years, I would tell you that this is probably the best because they're mild. They're not quite as bright as any other highlighter is. And so therefore, the see-through is not quite as bad. Uh, most highlighters, you're going to get some see-through. This is the most minimal highlighter that I've found. And again, I'm going to post a link in the description of this video so you can grab this on Amazon if you're so inclined. Um, I will tell you, let me just go back to, to highlighters. If it's just you and a highlighter, okay, Sharpie is better than Bic. I have tested this over and over again. For some reason, and I can't explain it, Sharpie highlighters are better than Bic. So if you're going with the cheap off-the-shelf kind of Staples style highlighters, use yourself a Sharpie and, and not necessarily a Bic. I want to mention, too, that there is a special kind of Bible called a wide margin Bible. I've been talking about wide mar margining for a very long time. This is what a wide margin looks like. Remember the other Bible I showed you had hardly anything as far as margins? A wide margin is one that has wide margins, thus the name. Okay, It's not rocket science here. This gives you a lot more room to write marginal notes in your Bible. But again, I still think that your miscellaneous system is actually going to pay dividends as you go. So I use mine for both. I'll go ahead and just write a note right in the margin, but I also very often use my miscellaneous system for things that require a lot more space consideration. So I will post an example of a wide margin Bible in the description of this video as well. There's a bunch of them out there. Really just search it up. I'll show you the one that I have, or at least the nearest approximate. I think the one that I actually have is now out of print, but there's one that's pretty similar to it that you can you can get. All right. Uh, now, there are journaling Bibles, too. I want to mention that a journaling Bible like this one right here from Crossway. I've done reviews on these Bibles. That's the kind of Bible that has a big, huge, wide journaling space right here. And so you can write a lot in a journaling Bible. But again, even if you write a lot, notice how many verses this is really gone, kind of well, it's taken up all that space that you you might want later. And so even if you have a journaling Bible, I still think the miscellaneous system is going to be better for you because it's going to look like this. You tell me which one looks better. Now, that does look kind of pretty, okay? But I think this is going to give you far more room to go ahead and make those notes that you've been thinking about, especially if, if you want to use the same Bible for years and years. And I do think that's a good idea. The miscellaneous system is going to give you much more space than any other system, even journaling Bibles. Okay, so let me let me wind up here with just five or so uh, extra tips that I've learned over the years I think are going to be helpful for you. First of all, test all of your writing implements on the concordance first, okay? If you're going to test highlighters and pens and markers and pencils and things like that, go to the concordance where it really doesn't matter and test them out there. The last thing you want to do is just go to John 1 and use some pen that's going to bleed through six pages. Okay, please don't do that. Test it in an inconspicuous place somewhere else in your Bible. Second, use blank pages for creating lists of key doctrines. Now, what I mean by that is this. 
Uh, here's an example if I can find it. Uh, right in the beginning of the New Testament, there's usually a blank page or two, if you can see that. Can you? This right here is a list of all the Messianic prophecies that, well, at least a bunch of them that I've discovered in my Bible. Whenever you have a blank page, and there's not many of them in your Bible, use it for as important of a thing as you can possibly think of. You might want to think a little bit before you just start using those blank pages, because most Bibles don't have a lot of blank pages. But when you have them, use them up. Third, cross-reference your notebooks to each other. Now, I've mentioned here having multiple notebooks, an M notebook and an X notebook and so on and so forth. I actually have various other notebooks as well. I have notebooks on philosophy and other such things. I have a digital miscellaneous notebook as well, which is miscellaneous that I keep on my computer. It's really good to cross-reference those things to each other. So let's say you've got miscellany number one on creation, but you also have something somewhere else. Let's say Aristotle's view of creation in your philosophy notebook, just link it. Just make sure to take a note in both places that there's something else in a different notebook. That's going to help you to stay familiar with your own topics as the system builds over the years. Fourth, tab in extra pages for extra note-taking. There is a process called tabbing in an extra page. You can't do it too much um, because eventually it's going to stress your Bible if it gets really chubby with a lot of extra pages that you put in there. But basically what you do is you glue in an extra page by making a very small fold on the edge of that extra paper, gluing that tiny little tab that you've created and stuffing it into a nice little spot in your Bible. You can see that I've done that once or twice or thrice in my Bible. Uh, let's see here. You see this? Tab that in. I just glued it right on in there, and that's extra space for me to make a catalog of things that I'm keeping track of. And then finally, um, I do think it's probably a good idea to stick with one main Bible for as long as possible. And then I guess I have an extra one here, sixth one. Create a digital miscellaneous system on your computer, too, for alphabetical entries. That's right, yeah. The nice thing about a digital miscellaneous system is that you can make them alphabetically because, you know, you can return space and just add things right in between them. Can't really do that on paper, but you can do it digitally on your computer, all right? So that's all of my thoughts on Bible note-taking all in one place, all in one video now. Thank you so much for checking into my channel. Don't forget to check out the links that I'm providing in the description of this video because there are some good ones. I do love you lots, and we'll talk to you later.